Hey, skiers. I'm Jeff from SkiEssentials.com. And I'm Bob. How's it going? Bob and I are here today to talk about the Rosignol Experience 86 Ti. Um, not necessarily a new ski for 2024, just a new graphic. I think that we, when we've revisited some skis recently, viewed it through a slightly different lens. I, I agree. Some of these things come up. I think Miris Core earlier yep. uh, this spring kind of made me think about that. And this one is another good one to revisit and just yeah. kind of take a second look after a couple of years. And what have we learned? Even for me, um, kind of going back through the Rangers with Emily. Yeah, good. Like yeah, that was good really one. valuable yep. too. And I don't know that like think my opinion necessarily changed that much over the course of, the, of a year, but it was nice to get, yeah, a new, new set of eyes from Emily. And yep. yeah, it's just, it's just fun. And this is a, this is a little bit different because this it's been two years, like two full years since we've talked yep. about this ski or that ski over there. That's the 2022, which then became the 2023 Experience 86 Ti. And just kind of as a reminder, like this was a little bit of an interesting change, I thought, for Rosignol. Mm -hmm. They took a line of skis that was really marketed as an all-mountain collection. Um, you know, what was the widest, the widest experience that we ever got was what, 94? No, the, we had the like, red they one. They made 100. Oh yeah, they, right. Sorry. That was yeah. a, a while back yeah. now. So they've gotten progressively narrower and narrower to the point where this is now the widest ski in the collection, the 86 Ti. And they definitely feel more geared towards just groomer performance than yeah. ever before, especially the version that predated this one. Right. That yep. one with the, like the long rocker and the early taper and the shovel and stuff like that. It kind of had some like Soul and Sky 7 influence in its shaping. Yeah, like a lot of that air tip technology totally. in there too. And this is like way different than that. Yeah, totally. So just fun to revisit this ski, Bob. As a refresher, do you want to take us through construction? Because um, there's a lot going on in this thing. Yeah. And it's a pretty hefty price tag. I think we're up to, what, $8.99? Yeah, for a flat ski yep. here, we were at eight forty nine for a couple of years over there. So it's not an inexpensive ski, and when you hit a price tag like that, at least I expect there to be a certain amount of technology in the ski. <laughs> yeah, I think this one is warranted. It's definitely one of those ones that, th over the years, this is one of my kind of revisiting theories. Is like, oh, this is a premium model. This ski totally. is justified in that price tag yep um it does you know sit alongside stokely kessley these you know black crows some of these other premium models that yep. have this um and like like those skis it, it does start with the build um, we do get a full poplar wood core in here with two full sheets of metal uh, they use their carbon alloy matrix as well so that that cross hatched uh you know carbon stringers to allow them to fine tune the torsional and longitudinal stiffness without adding too much weight. Uh, and then they do a couple of interesting things just with the how they put that wood core in there. So full sidewall, fully underfoot, and then we get two step downs to the tips and tails. So it does taper down a little bit to semi-cap a little bit. And then where the rocker starts in the tips and the tails, it does go to pretty much full cap. Yeah, so we're, we're seeing that reduction in core thickness. Uh, you know, it's one of those things where conditionally, if they kept that core and those two full sheets of metal going. Oh, like this build? Like that the build whole throughout, thing. then it's too much. Way too um, much. And even so, like, it's a stiff, it's a ski. stiff ski. It yeah. is really stiff. Um, you know, this longer length hits about 2,000 grams on the scale. So it is in that heavier and stiffer category for sure. Absolutely. Uh, and then in the shovel, they use their drive tip solution, which is their uh, energy damping uh, technology. So basically they're taking carbon fibers in the very tip and then linking them into visco material or more rubberized. So it's kind of like a radiator where the yeah. energy gets dispersed uh, from the very tip into the forebody of the ski where then it hooks into the core. And it works really well. It's one of those things that's like, why is it, yeah, why is this ski so smooth? Right. Like that's, that's why. Yeah. So using that technology in the, in the tip of the ski really makes a lot of sense. 
Um, but that's pretty much it. You know, it's an interesting way of building their skis, kind of using that step down technique. Uh, does offer a little bit more, you know, a little bit more accessibility in the forebody. Yep. Uh, you can flex it, get it to initiate, uh, and then just a little bit more forgiving in the tail. Again, if it was that full thickness, it would be pretty, pretty abrasive. Right. Um, so moving on to shape, I think shape is, is a pretty interesting story here. And I think like, I don't know, at least for me, what's particularly interesting about this shape story is this ski, as much as it differed from the previous generation of experienced skis, also feels like it helped inspire the new Forza skis. Totally. The, yeah, like, a lot of notes up here. Yeah, the first yeah. time I saw those Forza skis, like Rosignol, I think it was like about a year ago, Yeah, Rosignol kind of showed up with a couple of prototype pairs and just showed us the shape, and they weren't even final production skis. and. It was just, it was impossible to ignore the fact that they looked a lot like this yep. tip. Um, and I do think it's an interesting shape. I remember having the same conversation when they first came out with these skis. Um, definitely a directional ski here. And it is like an interesting blend of camber and rocker. There is a lot of camber, yep. especially like from a height perspective. I'd say like almost a centimeter of camber in each ski. Maybe eight millimeters would be would be about my guess. Yeah. And that's a lot of camber height. For, especially given the stiffness of the flex. Yeah, and yeah. just like in 2023. Right. Like you don't yeah. see super high rise camber like that very often. And then we do have pretty long tip rocker up here. Like by length, I don't think it's that much shorter than those previous experience skis. No. Where the difference lies is in that taper. So this ski has no early taper whatsoever. So full extended side cut, you know, the widest point of the ski is all the way out here at the end, which is way further than the contact point. Right. And you pointed out that in the tail as well. And, you know, I think it's probably more important in the tail when you really start thinking about the way it feels on snow. So the rocker starts here, but the widest point of the tail is way up here. And in almost right. like, kind of looks like it juts out at the very end. So if you're skiing a flat ski, a low edge angle, you'll retain some of that maneuverability. Like you will have a shorter effective edge. The higher your edge angle, the stronger the ski is basically gonna feel. Yeah. Which is like essentially the same exact concept as that Forza 70. Like right. you get it super high yeah. on edge and you get, you get the benefit of like, a really, really long effective edge. Like this is a 176 centimeter ski. Your effective edge at a high edge angle is probably like 174. Yeah, it's way above average. Totally. For a ski like this, super long effective edge yeah. when the running length is a little Exa shorter. Exactly. So there's a like difference. Effective edge to running length, yeah. that ratio is, yep. is a lot closer in these than most skis yeah. on the market. Yep. And then something that has come up Really, just what, in the past couple days here? Yeah, like yesterday. <laughs> so we have, I'd say, built a pretty good working relationship with the guys at Sooth Ski, mm -hmm. who are known for measuring skis. Um, they have their own like proprietary systems and tools to measure skis. And they basically measure like the outline shape, the rocker profile, like every kind of dimension that you could think of, and then also bending stiffness and torsional stiffness. And this ski is actually closer to 84 underfoot. Yeah, and not just by Soothe, but by our other comparative measurements yeah, we like that put we've it on, done you here. Did, you put it on top of what, a wingman? Uh, a wingman. Wild, a wildcat. Yep, I, I took some vocal skis, like a Deacon 84. Yep. You know, it's, it's an 84. Yeah, which like, I don't think is a bad thing by any means. If it's you're like, not from like a skiing perspective. No, I think from a consumer perspective, yeah. it can be a little confusing. Yep. But like it made total sense to me when we right. had that realization, because to me, they feel like they fall into a category with Wingman, with Deacon, yeah. with what am I forgetting? Uh, uh, Montero AR. Exa right. Like, like they feel yeah. more like in that category, which to me is more like wide carving ski 
and less narrow all mountain ski. Right. So I think that was very interesting, like that 84 underfoot. And I think that's like, I don't know, that's important for people to know and understand. Totally. From a consumer perspective, like if you're shopping for an above 85 all mountain ski and like you set your filters that way, like this one's going to come up yeah. as an above 85. Right. Uh, right. You know, kind and of where you're we... Gonna, you're going to see it with... Enforcer 88, yep. with Kendo 88, with Brahma 88, with Ripstick 88. Yep. It couldn't be more different than a Ripstick 88. Right. But on paper, yeah, like, yeah. It, it's probably pretty hard to differentiate between the two for some skiers. Right. So, pretty interesting. Yeah. So, just, you know, keep that in mind and do what you want with that information. Like, yeah. Do nothing with it. Do a lot with it. <laughs> yeah. Whatever. But yep. <laughs> knowledge is power. Yep. Um, so, kind of moving on to a performance performance talk here. Um, I feel like we already kind of touched on it briefly, but they absolutely rip as carving skis. Yeah, and that the Montero AR comparison, comparison. comes up too, because yeah. you know I have the AR in the same size as this. Yep. And like, if you're thinking that Stokely is one or two levels above, like. It's not. Like, the performance is it's, yeah. very, very similar. Yeah. You know, they go about it in slightly different ways, for sure, but there's no loss of performance going from no. what's perceived to be the premium of 84 underfoot skis to, to this. Yeah. And it's, it's a very rewarding ski yeah. as a carving ski. Yep. That is definitely my favorite thing to do on it, to the point where when I ski the Experience 86 Ti, I don't really want to do anything other than carving, and we can talk about that in a little bit here, because I know you maybe don't agree 100%. Like, you you take them off trail, yeah, and they work fine. For me, I just enjoy the way that they carve. And it is interesting, like, I've, I think I've mentioned before, like, sometimes I prefer being on a slightly wider ski for carving, because for me, at least, it gives me more confidence, mm -hmm. or at least, like, maybe more forgiveness, like I'm not going to boot out. Right. And I know that because the ski is wide enough underfoot that I'm not going to boot out. It's not going to get bogged down, stuff like that. Where even on like, even on a, say a Forza 70, but really more like a, a GS race ski, like something 70 or narrower, yeah. like those skis to me, I understand the benefit of having a narrower waist and more edge to edge quickness. like when we have our ski bum races. Yep. Like, I am faster on a ski that's narrower than I would be on that. But just cruising around groomers, like, personally, I don't really ever want to go much narrower than that. I don't think you're alone. I think there's a lot of people that find that level of comfort. Yeah. You know, it's like, oh, I just feel more comfortable and confident on this wider platform. Right, it's and like, I'm not in a race point. course, so yeah. who cares if I'm losing, like, a few right. tenths of a second in between each turn because the edge to edge quickness isn't as precise or as yeah. efficient like that doesn't bother me too much um, we pretty much skied them back to back with the wingman 86 black edition yep and like it was kind of hard to differentiate between them i thought this yeah. one went a little straighter that was kind of my take I struggled slightly because I was on that 176. Yeah, which works great for me. Works great for you. I am, yeah, I am squarely that. in this 185. Yeah. Um, you know, trying to adhere to that shorter, slightly shorter radius with the ski being that stiff was a little bit challenging. Makes sense. Whereas, like, the wingman was a little bit lighter, a little bit more flexible. Yep. I had more success on the wingman in that size. Yeah, this feels more stout. Yeah. Yeah, which was like for me harder to put my weight behind. Yeah, well, that's it, and that like that is an interesting phenomenon when yeah. you get on a short, stiff ski that's like a little too short for you. Yeah. it can be like a little unnerving. Yeah. because it's gonna be very reactive to the point where it might do something when you don't necessarily want it to do that yeah. thing. No, moving up to like the seventeen and a half meter radius and the yeah. one eighty five is. Certainly more in my wheelhouse. Yeah, but yeah, super fun. You know, I, I don't think that they're the easiest ski to ski. I don't think yeah, it's. No, yeah. I, I don't think it's a good choice for an intermediate. 
No. I don't, I don't think that's really what Rossignol had in mind when they set out building this ski either. Well, and they, they have, have the basalt. Like, they've yep. got, right, they've got 82 TI, yep. which I think is easier to ski. And then they've got 86 basalt and 82 basalt, which right. are way easier to ski. So this really is like an expert level rip and carving ski. Totally. And I don't know that it, like, I don't know that that comes through on paper. I feel like people might just like think about old experience 88s, look at the price tag, and then they're like, forget it. Yeah. No way. Which, speaking of price, that's what's the price on that right now? Yeah, so we have a handful of these uh, 23 versions, I guess, 22, 23. Yep. A uh, little over five hundred and fifty dollars, and where this goes up to nine hundred. Nine hundred so as a flat ski. Yeah, like a three hundred and fifty dollar. Yeah. Savings if you same ski. Same ski. And yep. let's all just be honest right now. That's a better graphic. I'll agree. I'll take it. <laughs> but <laughs> yeah. we have we have a handful of one seventy sixes and then a few a few more one eighty five. So yeah. It's nice to see. You know, we have ten pairs or so left. No, and like what you know, especially when you start to think about it, like with a comparison to a Montero AR. Totally. How much is a Montero AR? Like 1200 $1,300, yeah. something like that. So less than half the price. Right. You can get that ski, going to have a equivalent <laughs> experience. Yep, totally. Or at least close. Yep. Too, like, close enough that non-discernible by some people. I think that this at $550 is one of the better steal. deals. Yeah, yeah. 100%. I couldn't agree more. Um, now, I'm going to dig up the footage, and we did include this in the 2022 review when we per first put this out, but we've talked about it kind of just casually, internally, over the past few days here, Bob, um, and it seems like we both agree that they are not the easiest ski and not the best ski off-piste, yeah. but you can do it, so other yeah. people probably can too. Yeah, I think that, like, this is one of those examples where my size Helps. Is, is an advantage. Size and background. Um, yeah. Yeah. Like, at least with the narrow waist, like for moguls, I find that this thing is super quick edge to edge. And then with just that slight bend, like, I'm able to put this thing into, <clears throat> into a bump pretty easily. Yeah, without worrying that without, it's going to just kick you back. Yeah. No, I like the support. And then... Like we talked about with that tail, like there's enough tail rocker to... Right, it's not pit pitching you forward unnecessarily. No, it's not killing you. So there's enough tail rocker that you can push off the backside of that mogul. Yeah. If this was like that Kessley squared off tail. Right, then it's a different you know, story. Or Montero even, like that's, then you're asking for trouble. But just that little bit of a bend uh, really, really helps and it's, it's super supportive. Um, so when you're comparing it to something like a Kanjo or even a little bit wider, a Bent yep. uh, 90, when you're pushing off the back, they're just not as supportive. Yep. You know, it's nice when you're heavier and stronger to have that support on that back side of the bump. Yep. And then you're getting the resulting edge grip as well. But yeah, softer snow, this is going to, this camber is going to be an issue. Like that's pushing the tips and the tails down. down. Right. Uh, so anytime you're in softer snow, you have to be lighter on your feet right. to be able to move the ski from one turn to the next. So it's an interesting combination. I think that the off-piste is there, but there's a demand. You know, there, you're, what you put into it is what you're going to get out of it. So it's, yeah. it's a challenge. It's not like they're like Kanjo, a much better much easier off piste ski yep. than this. Yep. Um, but that doesn't mean that it can't be done, especially for larger and more aggressive skiers. Yeah, I think you just need to have the, the right technique. Yeah. Like I like you were talking about like edge to edge quickness and I was thinking like, well yeah, but you gotta know what to do after that right. too. <laughs> and I think that's the important part. Like that's where it gets me. Yeah. Like, yeah, sure, it's like edge to edge quickness is fine, but then like, you know, you're pretty good at like unlo like waiting and unweighting. Yeah. And like you know how like it's kind of like backwards to what feels intuitive in moguls? Like you need to right. like un un like pre unweight. Yep. And then push down. Like you do that very well. I do that 
okay <laughs> so, sometimes. And I feel like that's the key. Yeah. Like you need to be able to do that. Where like some skiers do that really well. Like Chris that works works here. Yeah. Like he, I bet he would make that thing look beautiful. Yeah. Like skiing it even through trees because he's got that like really good controlled unweighting and weighting technique. Yeah. But yeah, I think if you're like, if you're like me and it's like you're, <laughs> the amount of force that you're putting into the snow when you're skiing moguls stays more consistent through the whole experience, then like that turns into a challenging ski. Yeah, it's, it, it's, if you do that, it's going to want to keep turning. Right. And that's when things right. get away from you. And like that's when my left arm goes way yeah. over there. <laughs> and we look at the footage and we're like, what's that arm what's doing? What's that arm doing? Uh, um, so, yeah, it's not the easiest ski off piece that can do it, but you need to be a pretty good skier. But I think you should be a pretty good skier if you're choosing the ski anyways. Yeah. And if you're like me and you choose it, then you probably are staying mostly on trail. And like that's fine. I got plenty of other skis that I can take into moguls right. and have fun. But, really it, have but that, it does, like, that's part of that conversation. It's a little bit narrower. It's a little bit stiffer. There's a right. lot of camber. Right. Like what we used to think of experience right. doesn't really apply to this no, anymore. No, not at all. Like that old Experience 88, for me, that was an easy mogul yep, ski. Yep, totally. Where this is challenging. Yep. But rips on firm yeah. snow. And so. these, are the, these are the types of conversations that come up with this revisitation process, yeah. which I think is important. I agree. Super fun. So, yeah, that's it. Anything you want to add? Not particularly. I just, I love this thing. I like, yeah. you know, a side note, like this is one of my yeah, you, yeah. favorite skis. I think it's great here. too. Yeah. I've always thought it was great. Um, it's like, it's, it's always like weirdly disappointing for me for yeah. some reason <laughs> when these skis don't become more popular. Yeah. Because like, I remember when they came out with that thing initially, and I was like, looks great, ski is great, feels yep. like a winner. Yep. But I think the 850 price tag turned people off. Yeah. Uh, you know, I think if the performance is there, if the smoothness is there, then, it's, yeah. then those things are warranted. But obviously, yeah. that's up to individuals' decisions. Um, you can buy it as a system. Yeah, I don't know if, we're, if we've offered the TI as a system. No, and I don't believe we plan to, Yeah. which is, in my opinion, indicative of our opinion. I don't think you should buy it that way. Yeah. Because as much as, like, I think Look is a good binding manufacturer, I do not think their systems are very good. Yeah. No, I think that your normal 13-din regular Alpine binding works great on this. Or Pivot. I don't know. It's a, it's a, for the same reason I'm not putting a Pivot on my AR, it's a funky waist width. Yeah, that's a good point. I know, 70, it's, a good, 70, it's a no man's land for yeah. pivot. Maybe stretch a 75 around there. I don't know. I think they just need <laughs> to start making pivot 85s. <laughs> yeah, that would be nice. Um, so anyways, that's it. Here's the 2024 Experience 86 Ti. Got a few of those left over on discount, like Bob mentioned. Let us know if you have any questions, as usual, and we will talk to you soon. Bye.